In this video, we will discover a very important property of groups. One that you may have already noticed in the Cayley tables we looked at earlier. To show this property on a concrete example, we're going to explore modular addition first. This is a simple number system with a funky kind of addition. Once we're on that subject, we will also briefly look at other number systems to find out which ones can be turned into groups and which ones cannot. Remember that weird clock that we talked about earlier? The one with only four digits on it? This is an example of modular addition. The basic idea is that instead of putting your numbers on a line, where they keep going up forever, you put them on a circle instead. Every time you count to higher than three, you fall back down to zero. On a line, two plus three equals five. But on the four digit clock, two plus three equals one. You can see this in a number of different ways. You can start at the top of the clock at the number zero, and then walk around the circle counting to two, and then to three. You end up at one. Another approach is to use traditional addition first, which yields five. Then you subtract four until you reach a number less than four. You're basically calculating the remainder after dividing by four. So two plus three equals one. You can also do multiplication modulo four. Two times two equals zero. In my videos on complex numbers, I used this as a great example of a non-zero number that squares to zero. But we will focus on addition here. We already looked at the addition table before, and we noticed that it has exactly the same structure as the rotations of the square. These two groups are isomorphic to each other. They're essentially the same group, just with different names. Today we're going to need a bigger example, so let me switch to a real clock. You know, a good old analog one. It has 12 numbers on it, from 0 to 11. Every time you go higher than 11, you fall back down to zero. You can use this small number system to do addition and multiplication. When you calculate seven plus nine, you get 16. But then you have to subtract 12 until you get a number lower than 12. So in addition modulo 12, seven plus nine is four. Here's the addition table. You can quickly verify that 7 plus 9 indeed equals 4. 11 plus 1 equals 0. And 6 plus 6 also equals 0. As soon as we have a table like this, the most natural thing to ask is, is this a group? We can easily verify that all the properties of a group are indeed satisfied. You can see that there is a neutral element, the number 0. The top row, and the first column simply repeat the headers of the table. You also see that each number has an inverse, because each row and each column contains exactly one neutral element. So here once again you can see that 11 and 1 are each other's inverses, because they add up to the neutral element. 6 turns out to be its own inverse. You can also prove that addition is associative and that each cell in the table contains one of the 12 numbers. So yes, the integers with addition modulo 12 are a group. In fact, this group is cyclic. You can see that visually in the Cayley graph, because the graph looks like a long cycle that keeps going around. The abstract definition of a cyclic group is that it can be generated from a single element. Indeed, we can use the number 1 as our generator. By adding it up a few times, we can reach every other element in the group. Note that you could also use 5 as a generator. Since 5 and 12 do not have any factors in common, the multiples of 5 reach every number in the group. It does not matter which generator you use. As long as the entire group can be produced with a single generator, the group is called cyclic. Now we come to the good stuff. I'm going to show you another property that all Cayley tables have, a property that all groups must have. 
It relates to the simple observation that you can always cancel something on both sides of an equation. This is something only a group can do, because groups have inverses. You just put the inverse of x on the left and on the right of the equation, and then, by definition, the inverses cancel. This allows us to get rid of x from the equation altogether. That's a great tool that we can use for solving equations in algebra. But what does this cancellation trick look like in the table? Let's see. The first equation has three names in it, x, y, and z. So let's pick three different elements in our group. I don't want you to get distracted by any specific values, so I'm going to blur out the contents of the table and I'm just going to use three abstract elements with the names x, y, and z. Just imagine that each of these cells contains a specific value from the actual table. We have x on the left of the multiplication, so we take the row labeled x. And we have y and z on the right, so we take their columns. The equation says that x plus y must be the same as x plus z. So the value in this cell must be equal to the value in this other cell over here. We don't know exactly what the value is, only that they're equal. Good. Now watch what happens when we cancel x on both sides. The algebra tells us that y must be equal to z. But y is at the top of this column and z is at the top of this other column. If y and z are equal, that must mean that we actually have only a single column. And that means that these two cells are actually one and the same cell. So what the cancellation property tells us is the following. If you ever find two different cells in a row that contain the same value, then they are actually not different cells after all. They must be the same cell. Another way to put this is that no two cells in a row can ever have the same value. If they did have the same value, you could cancel the number at the head of that row and you would find that the cells are identical. Okay, so we've discovered that all of the values in a row of a group table must be different. You can clearly see that this is indeed the case on the modulo 12 table. The rows of a Cayley table are always permutations of the group elements. That means that they just put all of the elements in some order, without any repetitions. The same is true for the columns. This just follows from the fact that you can also cancel things on the right. So we find that each row and each column of a Cayley table is a permutation of the group elements. But there's more. No two rows can be the same permutation, because that would place two identical elements in a column. So all the permutations must be different from each other. To summarize, we have discovered that each row is a unique permutation of the group elements. And the same is true for the columns. When the rows and columns of a table are free of duplicates, we say that the table is a Latin square. This is a key property of all groups. All Cayley tables are Latin squares. If you happen to play Sudoku, or if you like magic squares, you might recognize this property. Each row and column in a Sudoku grid must contain the digits 1 to 9 once each. All Sudoku grids are Latin squares. The algebraic proof for this property of groups is called Cayley's theorem. It says that every element of a group causes a permutation on other objects. In other words, whenever you discover a set of symmetries of some object, you know that each of those symmetries is, deep down, always a permutation. Here are the symmetries of the square again. Each of them can indeed be seen as a permutation of the corner points of the square. Of course, not all permutations lead to valid symmetries of the square. For example, this particular permutation would twist the square into some weird looking shape. Not all permutations of corner points are geometric symmetries. So the elements of a group 
are often only a subset of all possible permutations. In the next video, we will see that the Latin square property leads to a much more amazing fact about the internal structure of groups. That video will also explain why 12 is a really good number of elements for a group to have. I want to close this video by going over the well-known number systems to see which ones can be turned into groups. Unlike the symmetries of a square or the numbers modulo 12, sets like the naturals or the integers are infinite in size. That makes it impossible to draw their Cayley tables or Cayley graphs. So this part of the video is going to be a bit less visual by necessity. In the comments on an earlier video, someone pointed out that the phrase whole numbers is ambiguous. So from now on, I will try to use the term integers instead. The integers are the natural numbers and their negatives. Here's a trick question. Are the integers a group? Remember that a group is a set of elements and a binary operation. The integers with the addition operation are a group. But the integers with the multiplication operation are not, because there are no inverses. The multiplicative inverse of 5 is 1 over 5, which is not an integer. So, when talking about monoids or groups, you should always specify the set and the binary operation. That's why it was a trick question. A set can be a group with one operation, but can fail to be a group with a different operation. The natural numbers aren't even a group under addition, because, again, there are no inverses. A natural number like 5 does not have an inverse. We need to invent minus 5 and all the other negative numbers to fix that. An interesting subset of the integers are the multiples of some given number n. Here are the multiples of 2. Notice that they are closed under addition. The sum of two even numbers is again even. It would be a good exercise for you to verify that this subset of the integers, with the addition operation, satisfies all the rules of a group. This is true for the multiples of any integer n, including 0. The multiples of 0 are just the number 0 itself, which is indeed a very trivial group under addition. The next number system is the rationals. They have inverses for both addition and for multiplication. Note that the neutral element for addition is 0, but the neutral element for multiplication is 1. Different operations have different neutral elements. Inverses are always defined in reference to the neutral element. The number 5 and its additive inverse have to add up to 0. The number 5 and its multiplicative inverse have to multiply to 1. Ok, I obviously have to mention an important detail. To see the rationals as a group under multiplication, it's crucial that we remove the number 0. It does not have a multiplicative inverse, because we can't divide by 0. Once we remove 0, we get a group. Multiplication and division are defined for all non-zero fractions. But more importantly, notice that no amount of multiplication or division can ever turn non-zero fractions into the number 0. So, the rationals without zero are closed under multiplication, which is one of the first requirements for a group. In an earlier video, we talked about how the number systems are nested inside each other. The set of integers, z, is a subset of the rational numbers, q. But there's more going on here. Under addition, z is a subgroup of q. A subgroup is just a subset of the elements with the same binary operation and it again has to satisfy the usual requirements. Most importantly, the subgroup must be closed under the binary operation. Since the sum of two integers is always another integer, z is indeed closed under addition. It also contains the neutral element 0, and integer addition inherits its associativity from the rationals. Also, the negative of an integer is itself always an integer. Conclusion z plus is a subgroup of q plus. And in a similar way, many other number systems with the appropriate arithmetic operations are subgroups of larger number systems. One notable exception is the natural numbers. 
n is a subset of z, but n plus is not a subgroup of z plus, because there are no inverses for addition. I want to finish by looking at the complex numbers. Obviously they are a group under addition. Here's a line through the origin in the complex plane. Under addition, this line is a subgroup of C. It contains the neutral element, 0. The sum of two complex numbers on this line will also be on the same line. All of the properties of a subgroup are met. C is also a group under multiplication. As before, this only works if you remove the number 0, creating a complex plane with a tiny hole in the middle. This is often called the punctured plane. In the punctured complex plane, the unit circle is a subgroup under multiplication. It contains the neutral element, 1. The product of two numbers on this circle is always on the circle, because we just add up the angles. The circle is invariant under complex multiplication. Or, to put it in other words, complex multiplication is a symmetry operation on the unit circle. Can we find other subgroups under multiplication? Here's an interesting case. We talked about the roots of unity in an earlier video. Just to remind you, the fifth roots of unity are these five complex numbers, evenly spaced around the unit circle. Take any of these numbers and raise it to the fifth power, and you always end up at the real number 1. That's why they're called the fifth roots of 1. Now, note that these five complex numbers form a group under multiplication. That's because when you multiply any pair of these numbers, you add up their angles, and you always land on another one of the five numbers. The multiplication is also associative, and we have a neutral element, the number 1. Each of these numbers also has an inverse. Just take the number with the negative angle. The product of a number with its inverse gets the sum of the angle with its negative. That sum is 0, so we land at the neutral element 1, as required. We checked all the properties, so we indeed have a group. Interestingly, what we have here is a finite subgroup of an infinite group. This number here, right next to the neutral element, rotates over one-fifth of a full turn. By repeating that rotation a few times, you can reach every other fifth root of unity, including the number 1 itself. This proves that our subgroup of five roots of unity is cyclic. That shouldn't surprise you, because you can draw a regular pentagon, and now our five numbers are just the rotational symmetries of that pentagon. So, there is a neat connection here between geometric symmetries of a polygon and arithmetic operations on complex numbers. We started and ended this video with cyclic groups. Yes, that's right, you've been watching a cyclic video. We will have much more to say about subgroups next time. Until then, you can check out some of the references in the description. Or you can already watch the rest of the series on Patreon please consider giving us a big thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. We are very grateful for your kind support. See you next time.